morning. Please rise and take out the Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to page 377. Page 377 in your Trinity Psalter hymnal. Uh, we'll be singing all five verses of Join All the Glorious Names. Please be seated. Welcome to the third and final lecture of the Student Association's Spring Convocation here at Westminster Seminary, California. My name is Dan Kim. I, get to, I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Student Association here. And we are so glad that you're able to join us this morning. The Student Association hosts a convocation each semester in order to provide students the opportunity to learn from and engage with distinguished scholars and speakers. And our speaker today definitely qualifies as a distinguished scholar and speaker. Dr. Gregory Beale is professor of New Testament and Biblical Theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. He is an ordained minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and has been married 42 years to his wife, Mary. And for the past two, for, since yesterday, Dr. Beale has lectured in the morning about union with Christ and about Christ's righteousness in the evening. And today he concludes his three-part lecture series with today's lecture titled Priesthood in Christ. And so Dr. Beale, we thank you so much for your time, for you coming here. And let us give a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Beale. Well, it's good to be here. And um, 
We actually will look also at Christ as king, but mainly focusing on priests. I just want to read one verse and open in prayer, because we'll look at this verse later, Revelation 1, 6. Christ has made us to be a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand what it means to be a kingdom of priests, priest ruling, and that it would be for your glory and for your dominion forever and ever. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So I'm going to talk about the Old Testament background for Jesus as a representative uh, priest, but also uh, secondarily king, and uh, the background for that is Adam and Israel as representative king priests. And, and first of all, uh, Adam was a king priest in the sanctuary of Eden. Um, so part of Adam's carrying out the kingly commission of Genesis 1.28 was faithfully to carry out his role as a priest in the garden temple. 1.28 clearly shows he was to be a king because God says you're to rule and subdue over all the earth. And then we're not to separate Genesis 1 from uh, Genesis 2. Adam is placed in the garden for to serving and guarding. And those uh, two words, when you look at those together in the Old Testament, those are words used elsewhere for Israel worshiping and also for priests uh, serving in, in the temple and guarding God's word. And I can't go into all the background, but in my book, uh, The Temple and the Church's Mission, I have uh, quite, quite a... a substantial section trying to show that, in fact, uh, Eden was a temple, that Adam was a priest. <clears throat> um, the word uh, <clears throat> priest or temple is not used in uh, Genesis 1 to 3. Um, and so some think that, well, um, uh, really, Eden was not a temple and Adam was not a priest. You need the words. I know a very prominent scholar who... Uh, 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 I'm just not sure about this. Um, <clears throat> uh, Gordon Wenham has produced a, a wonderful uh, essay um, that I depended on to a great extent in my book uh, on showing that there are certain features of Eden that are just like uh, Israel's later temple. And basically, he doesn't put it this way, but uh, I, I conclude, and after adding a few things, that uh, if it feels like a temple and um, it tastes like a temple, and it looks like a temple, it probably is a temple. Uh, and then uh, one thing that Wenham doesn't mention is Ezekiel 28, where you have this being in Eden with the jewels of the high priesthood clearly related to uh, the jewels listed in Exodus 28, and he's in Eden on top of a mountain, and then it says he sinned and he was cast out of the sanctuaries. Wow. Wow. That word sanctuaries is used of the sanctuaries in Israel's temple, and so clearly identifying um, Eden with sanctuaries. So uh, Ezekiel really um, makes it, in my opinion, a slam dunk that Eden is a temple and that Adam was a priest. I think it's probably Adam and not Satan that's pictured there, but uh, at, at any rate. So... Adam's failure as a king priest uh, is, is clear. Uh, he did not faithfully execute his kingly and priestly task expressed in Genesis 1.28, including the task, I believe, of uh, ruling over and defeating the serpent. Remember, he's to rule over creeping things in Genesis 1.26 and 28. So you've got a creeping thing. It's coming in the garden, and he does not rule over it. <clears throat> if Adam had... Uh, he, would, he would have had endless and irreversible kingly and priestly existence and escalated blessings more than he had in Eden. Some scholars think that when Christ comes, he's gonna, he returns us to Eden, and we return to Eden in the new heavens and earth at the consummation. No, escalated Eden. It goes beyond the Eden that was uh, Adam and Eve were in. So a faithful carrying out of the commission in Genesis 1.28 and feet of the serpent would bring about an irreversible security, no longer a threat from evil or danger. But again, Adam failed in that. And then we find in redemptive history that uh, God raises up the uh, patriarchs. I, I'm not going to go through that, but I do that in my book. He raises them up as priests. 
And, uh, and then when Israel is created, uh, they are commissioned to be corporate Adamic priests. Exodus 19.6 suggests that the whole nation of Israel should have become mediatorial priests like Adam and Israel's high priest. Here's what it says. You're to be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Um, this uh, sometimes is hard to translate kingdom of priests, but you do have phrases elsewhere in the Old Testament like kingdom of Og, O-G, a king, a Canaanite king. Clearly that's Og who is to reign, a kingdom of Zedekiah in Jeremiah. Clearly that's Zedekiah who is to reign. So here a kingdom of priests, the priests are to reign. I think that's the idea. Um, so presumably they were to succeed where Adam failed. Israel, however, also fails. But we find later in Isaiah 61 and verse 6 that it says, Israel will be called priests of the Lord and ministers of our God at the very end of the time. So there'll come a time when they will finally succeed in that commission. Um, <clears throat> not only will they fulfill this priestly role, but they'll rule over the world's kings at the end of time, according to Isaiah 60, 10 to 14. We find how this occurs in the New Testament with the coming of Jesus, the representative true Israel and king priest who represents his people. Now, so we look at Jesus as the, as the kingly and priestly son of man, this is what we're, we're going to look at for most of the rest uh, uh, of the time, who endures through tribulation with his followers. And we're going to look at this in the book of Revelation. Now in Revelation 1, 5 to 6, Christ and believers are presented as kings and priests. Notice that uh, this letter uh, is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth, and then um, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. He's made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Um, very doxological passage. Now, in this section, discussion of Christ and saints as kings is necessary since it's inextricably linked to priesthood. Now, first of all, we get a meditation on the kingship of Christ in uh, Psalm 88, 27. This phrase here, faithful witness, that is a very clear allusion. Uh, you'll see it in the margin of the Nesalalan text. And for those of you who weren't in Dr. Bittner's class, if you want to preach redemptive historically, no matter how good or bad your Greek is, buy a Nesalalan 28th edition and look at the margins and, and use them. Uh, most of them are very good, and a lot of them will show illusions. Quotations are easy to pick up, but you've got to get the illusions. And that, that will really enable you to preach redemptive historically in the New Testament. You'll be bringing the Old Testament in. And this is one such illusion. Christ, this faithful witness in the psalm, is uh, associated with the future uh, eternal reign of the Davidic Messiah. Now Christ is that faithful witness. He has begun to uh, uh, fulfill uh, that psalm's prophecy. And one of the ways he's, he's done it is through uh, resurrection from the dead. Here's a reference to his resurrection. Remember, part of my purpose in, in, in my book is to look at texts where Christ is seen as resurrected and believers are identified with that resurrection. Uh, so the, 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 this meditation on Christ's faithful witness causes the uh, writer to break out in doxology to him who loves us. In fact, in the Greek text actually right there, there's a big, there, there's a division, there's a space. I like that because uh, you've got to take a breath and then go into doxology, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. He's made us to be a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory. And uh, he is the one who has redeemed his people from their sins through his blood, that is his death. People are released from their bondage to the power and penalty of sin by identifying by faith 
with Jesus' sacrificial death. His action of loosing us from our sins by his blood suggests a priestly function. That's what priests did. They would offer sacrifices in the blood, which would uh, release the sins of the people in the Old Testament, uh, though that was always temporary. Jesus does it forever, once for all, as the book of Hebrews says. And by, by the way, we're not going to look much at Hebrews. And um, uh, someone asked me why. Um, it's because in Hebrews, I didn't say this to him. Uh, I need to say it to him later. Um, but um, basically, it's because only Jesus is focused on as a priest in Hebrews. You've got to do a lot of exegetical footwork to see that uh, the people are identified with Jesus as priest. I think it can be done, and I've done that in my book, A New Testament Biblical Theology, but I, I just don't have time to do it here. Um, but it's still an implication, but a true implication, I think, there. Um, so this, uh, this may be a typological fulfillment of Israel's redemption from Egypt by the blood of the Passover lamb, as is evident from the clear allusion to Exodus 19, 6 and verse 6. Okay, he made us to be a kingdom and priest to his God. That this is not just an analogy, because that's often one way the old is used in the new. This is like this. So uh, believers, are, we're a kingdom of priests, like Israel being a kingdom of priests. I think it's more than that. I think this is a beginning fulfillment of Israel being a typological foreshadowing of us. Why do I say this? Because notice what it says, made. He made us to be. They were never able to fulfill it. The only way you and I can fulfill it is by God's sovereign hand through Jesus Christ. It's Christ who made us to be a kingdom and priest. Here, as in Hebrews, Christ is portrayed both as a priest and a sacrifice. That's that's oxymoronic, but that's the presentation. Christ's death and resurrection in verse 5 establish a twofold office. So notice here, he is ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the messianic king. He's also a priest, released us uh, from our sins by his blood. So he's king and a priest. Is it accidental that we're all of a sudden then called kingdom and priest? I don't think it's accidental. We're being identified here. Remember, that's part of union, identification. So at the very least, it's mild union here. We're going to see it's more. We're going to see it's strong union in a moment, but uh, there's identification here. So we establish a twofold office, not only for himself but also for believers. Their identification, our identification, with his resurrection and kingship means that we too are considered to be resurrected, born from the dead. Now that's that's the implication. Uh, I think we're going to see it's more than that as we go on. Um, so we're uh, resurrected, exercising rule and priesthood with him. We've not only been made part of his kingdom and his subjects, we've been constituted as kings together with him and share his priestly office by virtue of our identification with his death and resurrection. Remember, he's firstborn from the dead here. Um, and even being firstborn, this is a, a phrase for new creation here, for it's actually exegeted, intriguingly, in chapter 3 and verse 14, where it says, he's the beginning of the creation, and not the first creation. He's the beginning of the new creation. So that is elaborated on in chapter 3. Jesus actually exegetes throughout the letters uh, how he's presented in chapter 1, and this is one of uh, uh, the exegeses in chapter 3, verse 14. Firstborn from the dead means new creation, which, of course, we, we are part of. The escalated office of kingship and priesthood that was true of Christ at his resurrection is attributed to us so that we are kings and priests. Now, precisely how are we to exercise this function? Um, it's not yet explicit at this early point in Revelation, but it will not be surprising to find the answer lies in understanding how Christ himself functioned in these two offices. He revealed uh, God's truth by mediating as a priest through his sacrificial death, which we find here, released us from our sins by his blood. Um, and uh, he was a faithful witness in the, in the, in the midst of this. Uh, these two things were associated, I think, with um, how he functioned in these two offices. Uh, he, he, he reigns through 
uh, death, and, and that's the irony of the book of Revelation. Uh, throughout, I had a student who just did a dissertation on the ironic use of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation, and, and, and one of the ironies is, of course, clearly illustrated in chapter 5, where it says, John hears about the lion from the tribe of Judah, uh, the root of David, who has conquered. And then all of a sudden, it's juxtaposed with the next verse, and I saw a lamb standing as having been slain. So how, 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 does, how does the lion from the tribe of Judah conquer? Through death. And that, I think, is already anticipated here in our passage. So um, believers spiritually fulfill the same offices in this age by following Christ's model, especially by being faithful witnesses, by mediating Christ's priestly and royal authority, ironically, to the world. So Antipas, a fellow called Antipas, uh, in, in, in the letter, I think, to Pergamum, or it may be to Thyatira. I'll have to go back and double-check that. But Antipas is called a faithful witness. Um, in fact, it's Pergamum. And uh, why is he called a faithful witness? Well, he's, he dies there. Due to persecution, he dies. Uh, but he's called faithful witness. It's taken from chapter 1. He's identified with Jesus, the faithful witness. And so it shows that one of the ways you're a faithful witness is it does lead to death. And um, it is part of being, he makes that sacrifice as a priest. The expression in Exodus 19.6, he's made us to be a kingdom and priest, is a summary of God's purpose for Israel and primarily meant that Israelites were to be a kingly and priestly nation mediating God's light of salvation, salvific revelation by witnessing to the Gentiles. This was a purpose that was never uh, carried out by Israel. Um, the Old Testament prophets repeatedly blame Israel for never fulfilling it. For example, Isaiah 49.6 says to the Messiah, you will be a light to the nations. And this is after there's been a recounting, especially climaxing at the end of chapter 48, that Israel has not fulfilled their purpose. So like the Old Testament priests, now the entire people of God have free, unmediated access to God's presence because Christ has removed the obstacle of sin by his substitutionary blood. It is the light of God's presence that we are to reflect to the world. Now, when I say unmediated presence, we're not, it's inaugurated <laughs> unmediated presence because uh, if we were in the full presence of God, we'd be annihilated because we're sinful. So that full presence doesn't come until the consummation when in chapter uh, 22 it says uh, his name will be on our forehead and we'll be priest and his high priest. All of us seen as high priest in his immediate presence at that point. Uh, so... In, in, in view of the redemptive historical and prophetic eschatological fulfillment context of chapters 1 to 3 of the book of Revelation, the use of Exodus 19, 6, uh, probably as I said earlier, is not just an analogy but a typological foreshadowing, for it's in the very context here of Jesus fulfilling faithful, uh, the faithful witness and um, being the one who fulfills uh, the true priesthood. So um, we now serve as kings and priests in service to his Father, which is to be for his, his glory. Glory and dominion forever and ever. One Puritan, uh, I was reflecting on this, I think it's in this uh, book, I really uh, like this book, uh, Voices of the Past. They have two volumes now. But I was, I was reading, uh, one Puritan said, um, you know when we get into our troubles, illness, maybe you've lost your job, the first thing, Lord, how can I get out of this? Deliver me. And he said, you know, our first thought ought to be, how can we glorify God in this? How can we honor God? Is that our first thought? It's usually not mine, I have to confess to you. That's why I was convicted by reading that. Um, but that's the practical aspect of that. Our function as kings and priests is to, be honor, is to honor God, and we're going to see that that function really is to be a priest through suffering and sacrificing ourselves. So when that comes, we should say, Lord, as kingdom priests sacrificing ourselves, how can we glorify you in that? 
Now, this application of Exodus 19.6 to the church as a priestly witness is attested also by 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10 and 2, 9, which reads, a royal priesthood that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This develops the earlier mention of saints being living stones built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood in 1 Peter 2, 5. So the first Peter passage refers to Christians becoming part of living temple stones. Now, I don't have that up, but we'll look at it a little later. But it says that Christ was a living stone in uh, 1 Peter 2.4. And then in uh, 2.5, it immediately says they come to Christ as living stones. That's That's union at that point, the concept of union. He's the living stone. They come to him, and so they become living stones. And living means resurrection living there, identified with his resurrection as as the new temple. Um, So the repetition of living in 1 Peter emphasizes the organic relationship between the resurrected Christ and his followers. Again, I want to underscore, since I'm talking on union, that's a concept of union with the resurrected Christ. Christ. Um, we're in corporate unity with him. So um, both in Revelation 1, 5 through 6 and 1 Peter 2, Christ is implicitly presented as a priest with whom his people are identified explicitly as priests. And by the way, in the First Peter text, where it says we come to him as living stones, we're being built up as a spiritual priesthood, offering sacrifices. Um, Christ there is not just presented as a temple, but implicitly as a priest, because in the preceding context, in chapter 1 and verses 18 to 19 of First Peter, it says, you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb, the blood of Christ. So he's offering up himself, and uh, that leads to them. Uh, being a holy priesthood, offering up spiritual sacrifices. And, uh, and then later in 1 Peter 2.21, says, you, you've been called for this purpose since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So we can see that um, as a priest, he sacrifices himself. As a priest, we sacrifice ourselves um, in 1 Peter. Um, so both here and in uh, Revelation 1, 5 to 6, Christ is implicitly, so far implicitly, presented as a priest with whom his people are identified. Uh, and they're identified explicitly as priests. That Christ is a priest in verse 5, by uh, uh, loosing sins by his blood, will become more explicit. Uh, his priesthood will become more explicit in just a moment. And we'll see that the identification of Christ not only as a king, now that's explicit, but also as a priest in 1.5 with whom believers are identified is due to them being in corporate unity with the resurrected Christ. Now, 1 Peter not only shows that in 2.4-5, uh, Christ is living stone. We come to him as living stone. So when we come to him who is living, we become living. And living stones, we become the temple. Um, in Revelation 1.9, this becomes a little clearer uh, our um, union with Christ, notice, uh, develops the idea of kingdom from 1.6. I, John, your brother, fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, in Yesu. Um, so why are believers identified with persevering through tribulation? And I think what that means is they're ironically reigning in a kingdom, There we get uh, the ironic idea, I think. And the reason for it is because they're in Yesu. This is a more classic in Christ passage. You don't find that kind of language uh, too much outside of Paul. Now, you do find the concept, I believe, outside of Paul. And that's part of the purpose of the the book I've just submitted. But uh, here's a case where uh, Paul, I don't think he ever says in Jesus. I'll have to go back and look. But typically it's in Christo or um, um, uh, in, in, in Jesus uh, with, with a genitive. Um, so um, believers 
have become identified with him there in Jesus, and this wording expresses incorporation into the resurrected Jesus. This is tantamount to the concept of living union with Christ. And there are three ways believers find corporate solidarity with Christ. It's, he still has, by the way, he still has in his life, he uh, persevered through tribulation and was reigning in a kingdom, though it was a hidden kingdom. And, but he still has the status of one who did that, so when believers come into union with him in Jesus, they are attributed that as well. And so they participate in Christ's history. That's part of what union is. Remember, participating in uh, the Historia Salutis, uh, Christ's death and resurrection. In this case, participating in uh, the, the kind of life Jesus lived on earth. Um, we've already seen how they're identified with Christ as king and his kingdom, but now we'll see uh, the more specific reason why they share such a kingdom it's because they have an existential share in his very resurrected being as a king. This is the risen Jesus, uh, as we're going to see in, in the context here very, very quickly. So that it's not just participating in his history, but if they're really in Jesus, it's a living mystical union, I think, if they really are in Jesus. So it's both participation in, in, in the status of what he did in history, but also... They're in union with him and, of course, identified with his realm. Those are three important aspects that we saw yesterday of close relatedness, of which, remember, uh, the four subparts were union, participation in the history of Christ, identification with his realm, and incorporation. Okay, those are different ones, and sometimes those overlap. We see three of those, I think, overlapping in this passage. Um, now, Believers are reigning in a kingdom by enduring through tribulation because that is what Jesus did. It's likely that they are also priests because they are in Jesus. Now, priesthood is not mentioned in verse 9, but it's likely that that's why they're called not just kings. Of course, they're kings because they're in Jesus here, but probably that's why they're also called priests because he has the status of priest. And uh, we're going to see that in a moment in spades. Since Christ has the status of all these things, his followers share in his status. Now, Revelation 1, 12 to 16 is where we see Christ explicitly identified as a priest. He is presented as the Son of Man. And the Son of Man was not just a king in Daniel 7. He was also a priest. I had not seen that until... Uh, very clearly, some have, had said it, but I just hadn't, wasn't sure. And then, uh, and I also wasn't sure that that Daniel 7 theophany uh, uh, portrait of, of God sitting on a throne, the Son of Man coming in before the throne, I, I wasn't sure it was a temple thing. But Nick Perrin has now convinced me in his book, Jesus as a Priest, which is a Baker Bookhouse. Um, so uh, here, here we find our text, though. Let's look at it. Um, let me just, I don't want to get any phone calls. I'm getting nervous here. Ah, now I'm comfortable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so he, here's our passage where I think uh, we find Jesus really explicitly presented as a priest. So far it's been implicit. I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength." Now, he's presented as walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, chapter 1 and verse 20, you'll remember, says that the lampstands, the seven lampstands, are the seven churches. So he's identified as walking among the churches, portrayed as lampstands. And um, by the way, it's very clear that uh, here, 
uh, we get an identification of, of a, a visionary symbol, lampstands. You don't o- often get that in the book of Revelation, but you still have to ask the question, why are they presented as lampstands? Just to identify them uh, is not enough. Why are they presented as lampstands? And the reason is they're part of the temple. They're part of the furniture of the temple, figuratively speaking. Exodus 4, Exodus 25, 37 uh, describes the lampstands, of course, as being in that uh, uh, holy place in the temple. Zechariah 4, 2 to 10, which is actually the illusion of the lampstands here in our passage, also speaks of the lampstands as being in the temple. So the Old Testament priest, what's going on here? Uh, Why is Jesus walking among them? Well, the Old Testament priest, one of the duties was to trim the lamps, remove the wick and old oil, refill the lamps with fresh oil, and relight those that had gone out. So the idea here is Christ is tending the ecclesial lampstands and by commending, correcting, exhorting, warning as we see throughout the letters. And part of the task of Old Testament priests was to tend the light on those lampstands. So he's clearly, really explicitly presented as a priest here. Um, That he is said to be one like a son of man is based on Daniel 7.13. That is an allusion there to Daniel 7.13. And obviously here he is the resurrected son of man. This is a vision of the resurrected Christ right here. Um, So... Uh, I, I think maybe this is a time just to take a few minutes to talk about uh, why the Son of Man is not just a king but also a priest. It's very clear in Daniel 7 that the Son of Man is coming on clouds, coming before God's throne to receive authority, and that becomes very clear in um, uh, verse 14 of Daniel 7 where it, it says he, he will rule over kingdoms forever. And so he's certainly a priest, but how, I mean a king, but how about priest? Well, um, here's what uh, Perrin in his book, Jesus as Priest, uh, uh, summarizes from uh, Daniel 7, uh, arguing that Jesus is, is very closely identified with a priest, and uh, since he uh, is so closely identified, he probably is. So notice... Here, number one, the first indication, the temple foundation stone of Daniel 2 that smashes the four-port kingdom that is is parallel with the Son of Man of Daniel 7 who takes over the former rule of the four ungodly kingdoms. And if uh, the Son of Man is parallel with the temple foundation stone, then he's very closely related to um, the the temple at that point. Uh, They're they're, they're identified. And... um, by the way, you might not be familiar, remember Daniel 2, there's this statue in four sections representing the nations of, of the earth. A stone cut out without hands is, um, strikes the statue and smashes it, and then that's interpreted as being uh, God will set up his kingdom forever. But uh, that stone that then grows into a mountain and fills the earth is uh, probably a temple foundation stone. I've argued that again in my book, The Temple and the Church's Mission, in about a five-page section. I don't have time to uh, demonstrate it, but nevertheless, if you're interested in that, I direct you to my book. But I think he's correct here. Um, Number two indication that Jesus is a priest in the book of Daniel. Now, my wife, by the way, told me not to go through this. said, you're getting too much in in the trees here. Don't don't go back to the Old Testament at this point. You're going to ruin the flow of your your uh, argument. This is one time where I'm not going to listen to the voice of my wife. So um, the throne room scene in Daniel 7, 9 through 10 is a heavenly temple scene organically linked to the same kind of temple throne scene in Ezekiel 1, wherein both the throne has wheels. I hadn't noticed that, that uh, I wasn't sure it was a temple scene, but when Perrin pointed out that there are wheels mentioned at the base of the throne in both tacks, and Ezekiel 1 clearly a temple throne room text that probably indicates that what we have here is a temple throne room scene. And here's the language there of Daniel 7, 9 through 10. Thrones were set up. The Ancient of Days took a seat. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. I just hadn't, I just passed over that. Wow. Yeah, I think he's, I think he's right there. So it's, a, it's a, a, a temple throne room scene. Thirdly, in Daniel 7, the Son of Man is an Adamic figure. 
with explicit allusions to 126 of Genesis and 28 and Psalm 8. I wish I had time to go through that. I don't. But especially with respect to the idea of kingly dominion over beasts of the earth. Okay, so the, the kingdoms there are presented as beasts coming out of the sea, and he rules over them, just as Adam was to rule over the beast. But as an Adam figure also, as we talked about earlier this morning, uh, it should not be surprising the Son of Man is also a priest, as was Adam. And lastly, the priestly aspect of the Son of Man is reflected in his coming with the clouds of heaven up to the Ancient of Days. Perrin points out that about 70% of the occurrences of cloud in the Old Testament, which occurs 100 times, 70% have to do with clouds at the mountain temple of Sinai. By the way, Sinai was a temple. Don't have time to demonstrate it, but it's amazing. Um, 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 Michael Morales has a whole book on it. Uh, Sinai is a temple. I think he's right. Um, so, So clouds are either described at the mountain temple of Sinai or the Jerusalem temple, and in particular, in the temple, Israel's high priest would repeatedly have to create an incense cloud as he entered into God's presence in the Holy of Holies. Could the Son of Man be seen as entering through that cloud up to the Ancient of Days, evoking priestly associations? Um, So the Son of Man is a king, he's a priest. Now, the clothing in our passage could also resemble kingly attire. Its, uh, its use here evokes the image of a priest because of the clear atmosphere of the lampstands and the angels coming out of the heavenly temple who wear the same clothing as the Son of Man. If you go to chapter 15, 5 through 8, you see these angels coming out of the heavenly temple and they have the same clothing that's described here of the Son of Man. The, the ambiguity may be deliberate. He's likely both a king and a priest, which would have precedent in the Son of Man of Daniel 7. uh, David himself was a king and a priest. Uh, In our passage, it says that in uh, Revelation uh, 1, 12 to 18, Jesus had a foot-long robe, a foot-length robe, which is used only elsewhere, 12 times in the Old Testament, of a priest's clothing. So again, this is enhancing the notion he is indeed a priest who has priestly oversight of the churches and has constant priestly presence with the churches. Revelation 1.20 identifies the stars, remember there's seven stars too, with angels. So the stars in verse 16 represent uh, basically angels, and it shows that Christ is the priestly ruler not only of the church on earth, but of its heavenly counterpart. These angels probably in some way are representative angels of the churches. I wish I'd had time to go further into that. There's debate about uh, who, who the angels are because letters are written to the angels. It's weird to write letters to the angels, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? But I, I wish I had time to go into that. Um, so, uh, also in our passage, uh, you find, we'll come back to it here, um, you find here that uh, Jesus has a sword. Uh, where's the sword? Is this a voice sound? Seven, seven. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Now, this probably is an illusion. By, by the way, all of this is just full of Old Testament illusions. But the sword out of the mouth probably comes from Isaiah 49 too, where the servant Messiah, God's going to make his mouth like a sword. And that's probably a development itself from Isaiah chapter 11. And verse 4, where a rod will come out of the mouth of the Messiah and uh, strike the ungodly in judgment. Um, and it's very clear it's developed this way in Revelation 19, 15, where, quote, a sharp sword coming from Jesus' mouth uh, is pictured. With, he has diadems on his head in 1912. He leads his armies in 1914. And he'll rule with a rod of iron in 1915. And he's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords in that context. Now, um, the description of Christ as a priest and a king in Revelation 1, 12 to 16 makes explicit that the activity in Revelation 1, 5, with which his followers are identified, that, remember, in, in 1, 1, 5, Jesus is only implicitly presented as a priest. Now this is explicit. 
he is clearly not only a king but also a priest doing the priestly activity of offering a sacrifice in chapter 1 and in verse um, verse 5. Now, um, I think it's important here to try to uh, uh, look elsewhere in the New Testament. Clearly in the Gospels, Jesus is probably portrayed as a priest. Again, I know someone who's just written a book um, on, on priesthood, but they don't have a section on the Gospels because they're not convinced that Jesus is a priest or presented as a priest in the Gospels. They're convinced that he's presented as a priest in Hebrews and elsewhere, but not in the Gospels. I, I think that what's happened there is that the person has made the mistake of the word concept uh, uh, issue. Because the word doesn't appear then the concept isn't there. No, you can have the concept without the word. Like sanctification, you don't have to have hagiadzo and hagias to express the doctrine of sanctification. There are many other ways to express it. And so I, I do think, and Perrin presents, and that's the focus of his book, Jesus as Priest in the Gospels. Um, he um, identifies Jesus as a, uh, a priest. And um, so... Why does Jesus call himself Son of Man so much in the Gospels? Uh, well, for example, in Mark 2, 1 to 10, remember where Jesus raises the uh, paralytic, uh, uh, he says, as the Son of Man has authority on the earth, clear allusion to Daniel, to forgive sins. Um, I'll show you I can forgive sins by, by raising the paralytic. He first says your sins are forgiven. And, and uh, the religious leaders are irritated by that. Uh, this is in line with other priestly figures in the Old Testament, early Judaism, who were God's agents in offering forgiveness, which ultimately came from God. Uh, thus, Mark 2 depicts Jesus as a high priest who offers forgiveness, though they're, they're irritated because they say, hey, he's offering forgiveness, he is God. So he's a divine priest at that point. Um, and throughout Jesus' ministry, Forgiveness revolves. Think about it. He begins to say, I, I, I am able to forgive. It's no longer centered in uh, the temple at Jerusalem. Uh, so priest offered sacrifices for forgiveness. Jesus offered a once-for-all sacrifice for sins on the cross. Romans 3.24 is a beautiful example of that, uh, which portrays Jesus as, remember, being set forth as a hilasterion. He's a mercy seat in his blood. The mercy seat was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. Paul, clearly there, the death of Christ is presented as a priestly offering, where again, Jesus is both priest and the sacrifice. Um, so as priest in the Old Testament, Jesus also explains the difference between clean and unclean. Remember Mark chapter 7? He says, you know, whereas the Pharisees beginning in that chapter have all these uh, clean and uncleanness laws about washings and you know, that sort of thing. Jesus says in response later in chapter 7 of Mark, it's not what goes into the mouth that is unclean, but it's what comes out of the heart uh, that is unclean. And, uh, and so he, he, he is declaring still what is clean and unclean, but in a different way. Um, he also is one who is the paramount prayer. He exercises a priestly task of praying for his people. Hebrews 7, 24 to 25, quote, But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Hebrews repeatedly refers to Jesus as an eternal priest according to the order of Melchizedek. For example, Hebrews 5, verse 6. So let's reflect a little bit on application here to our lives in the remaining minutes. One of the most striking descriptions of Christians as priests in all of the New Testament occurs in 1 Peter 2, 2 to 5 and 9 to 10. I, we mentioned that earlier, but I want to look at it again more specifically. Notice, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And then directly related to that, we come to the temple text. And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, 
but as choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. And then, verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This, this right here is basically you're a, a priesthood, a royal priesthood, to be a witness. Here it looks like it's by uh, proclamation, uh, but we're going to see it's also by a cruciform lifestyle. Um, so uh, he describes believers as a royal priesthood, and he expands more on the nature of this priesthood. Um, I'll focus on the nation, uh, on the notion of priesthood in this application, but it's by no means to, meant to marginalize the idea of believers as kings. But I want to conclude by focusing as priests. And we we saw in Revelation basically we could say that uh, in, in the book of Revelation the fact that uh, they are a kingdom and priests at least they're to be mediators between the uh, between God and the ungodly dark world. And we know that from Exodus nineteen five. Because that was really to be the mission of Israel. In fact, before 19.6, 19.5 says, You'll be my possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. And so as a kingdom of priests, they were to be God's mediating light to darkness, overcoming the darkness. And uh, that's, that's what believers were to do. But how were they to do that in the book of Revelation? Probably through living a cruciform lifestyle. And it was through that that a witness would be expressed. For example, in chapter 6 and verse 9, we see uh, uh, the martyred believers underneath uh, the altar in connection with their blood, and so um, uh, they're they're, uh, living a kind of cruciform lifestyle that is very similar to the lamb standing as having been slain in the previous chapter. 1 Peter Peter 2 makes explicit the role of believers as mediatorial priests as we just looked at here uh, in, in the bottom here, that the main point of being a kingdom of priests is to be witnesses. That's interesting, and that fits, doesn't it, with chapter 1 and verse 5 of Revelation. He's the faithful witness. So, you know, one might say, well, you know, that really doesn't have that much to do to, with priesthood, more with kingships. It's an allusion to the psalm, but in fact, it is connected to priesthood there, and now we find Peter says that's explicitly part of the purpose of being a priest. Now, there's several Old Testament allusions in, in this verse. I want to just focus on priesthood, holy nation, and as we've seen, that is from uh, Exodus 19.6. And we've seen that it's about priests who reign, you know, the kingdom of priests, priests who are to reign. I mentioned a few passages that I think demonstrate that. Um, now, this is to say, really, what are we saying? That Israel had an evangelical mandate as being a kingdom of priests. Um, Most Old Testament scholars really uh, don't focus on this, and they say that, no, they they really did not have that mandate. You don't find that really anywhere. Um, And the reason you don't find it anywhere is because of disobedience, uh, in in my opinion. So I remember debating someone about this. Well, you just don't, I mean, this this is one verse, and I mean, you know, you don't want to make a mountain uh, out of them. A molehill, and um, but I think this is the charge, and I think it fits with what Adam was to do as well. He was to go out of uh, his sanctuary, spreading uh, God's presence as an image bearer, reflecting God, as his progeny was intended to do. Uh, one way uh, <clears throat> to ask ourselves how we know whether we're really in Christ's temple is how much we long for the pure milk of the Word. Notice. Uh, the juxtaposition, newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that we may grow. And then immediately we have this text coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men. Uh, and so uh, I, I think uh, one way to know whether we're in the temple is uh, longing for the pure milk of the word is in, in inextricably linked to uh, being a part of the temple. Um, how much do we long for God's word? Uh, that, that's a sign as to whether we're in the temple. Um, another uh, uh, aspect of that is priests were to learn and especially teach God's word. So um, we're people who should yearn for the word and 
uh, know it well, whether we're an elder or not. Another sign of being a priest in the temple is if we desire to pray, since this was to be a function of priests in God's end-time temple. So uh, uh, Isaiah 56, 7 says that um, uh, the temple was to be a house of prayer for the Gentiles, interestingly. As a holy priesthood, believers in 1 Peter are to offer up sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Notice, holy priesthood offer up acceptable spiritual sacrifices. And what do we sacrifice? Well, um, we'll go on to um, next slide. We sacrifice ourselves, Romans 12, 1. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And uh, likewise, similarly, in 1 Peter Peter also specifies how we are to sacrifice ourselves. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So we're getting this idea that being a priest, uh, yes, is, is to be a person who prays, yes, a person who knows God's word, but it's to sacrifice. But it's to sacrifice ourselves, to live a cruciform life. And Whenever trials come, we have to sacrifice ourselves in various ways. Christ atoned for our sins by his sacrifice. We follow him. Of course, we can't atone, but we follow his example of suffering. And um, there are innumerable ways that we can sacrifice our, ourselves as priests in the new temple of Christ. For example, in 1 Peter, it later develops this idea of priesthood and what it's like and how priests are to function. Um, notice here we find beloved do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you but to the degree you share the sufferings of Christ keep rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation and that continues if you are reviled for the name of Christ you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, thief, evildoer, troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed but to glorify God in this name. Now notice that they are sharers in the sufferings of Christ. And how are they sharers in the sufferings of Christ? By the way, that's a concept of union there. Okay, um, Identification with his sufferings. And here, how do they suffer? If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed. So being reviled for the name of Christ is one way that they suffer. In this phrase here, notice it. Uh, why are you blessed? The spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2 refers to the coming Messiah and said, the spirit will rest on the Messiah. And here probably that is uh, the illusion that we have that they are being identified with that spirit that came to rest on Jesus. They're being identified with that spirit, the spirit of glory. And what's glory right here? It's the glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so um, they're being identified with that, another aspect of union again, with the resurrected glorious Christ. So, um, and we've already seen that 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5 has identified believers as being a part of the temple. So it's probably the glory of the resurrected Christ in the heavenly temple. And uh, in the very next verse after this one right here, it says uh, the following, for it is time, if it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. Um, and there the house of God uh, occurs, um, word house, only one other time in Peter, and it's in Chapter 2, verse 5, where they are a, a house uh, for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So this passage about sharing the sufferings of Jesus, having his spirit going through it, uh, his resurrection spirit, and by the way, it's that which probably energizes their, their, their endurance through sufferings, the resurrection power of Christ, and it's in the house of God. They are priests offering themselves uh, in, in the house of God. Um, 
In 1 Peter 4, 12 to 16, then suffering is viewed as believers being priests of the spiritual temple, offering up sacrifices by suffering. Those who so bear up will be spared the coming judgment, while those who do not will suffer it. Now, these sacrifices also include not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing, 1 Peter 3, 9. And this is similar to Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that's the last verse of Romans 12. Remember, it starts with, give yourselves a sacrifice to God. Um, What's the nature of these sacrifices? I realize I'm um, a couple of minutes over time. Uh, Give me a couple of minutes here. What's the nature of these sacrifices that we're talking about? The Old Testament talks about a sacrifice of thanksgiving, which was an actual animal sacrifice, Leviticus 7, 12 to 15. Um, Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. So Hebrews is saying let's give a sacrifice of thanksgiving for what? The sufferings they go through, in fact, uh, earlier in 1034, his audience accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. They were to give thanks even when they lost their own homes. It's an amazing sacrifice. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the state of California coming to your house? Let's, let's put it this way. I live in Texas. I can't imagine it in Texas. <laughs> you know, we have T-shirts, don't fool with Texas. So. But that's amazing. That's, you think about that. That, is, that takes supernatural resurrection power to offer thanks, a thanks uh, uh, of sacrificing your house for the Lord. How does this apply to us? Well, I remember in my church in New England, there was a fellow, he was an accountant for a car dealership, and his boss came to him uh, a few months before tax time and said, you know, we're going to need to hide some of our profits. He said, oh, I I can't do that. He said, "I, I completely understand. You're a really honest guy. But, you know, you need to work for the team here, and we can all make a little bit more money if you do that. He said, I don't think I can. And... And that kind of thing went back and forth. He said, okay, you can't have your job then. So he lost his job. That's a sacrifice. He was a priest sacrificing himself. That's cruciformity to lose your job or your home. And it was a sacrifice of thanksgiving. To offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving now would be to thank God for whatever trial you are in or I am in. To trust him in the midst of it. Knowing that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, those called according to his purpose. So now you know I'm finishing last overhead. What does it mean that we are priests? Well, we're mediators, we're summarizing between God and the dark world. It's what you and I are, witnesses. One of our priestly functions is to sacrifice ourselves in various ways. Cruciformity. We pray like Christ as priest. We declare what is clean and unclean. In other words, you know, uh, as, as, as believers, as brothers and sisters, we need to convict one another of sin. And, of course, then elders uh, do that as well in a more official capacity. Like priests, we should know God's word well. I talked last night about how Eve did not know God's word. And ultimately, Adam was accountable for that. Do we know God's word well? Jesus in the wilderness is presented by Luke as the last Adam because the genealogy ends with Adam, the son of God, and then goes into the wilderness, and he quotes God's word perfectly in response to the devil, not only showing himself to be true Israel, but true Adam, doing what Adam should have done. We should be doctrinal and ethical guardians of the covenant community in the same way Adam was of the first garden. So, May God give us grace to function as mediatorial priests to a dark world. The more unified we are about this priestly role of sacrificing ourselves and reflecting God's light to the world, the more impact there will be on the world. It's through sacrificing ourselves through various forms of suffering that we'll reflect God's light and gain the attention of some in the world and silence the world's accusations against our faith, as 1 Peter 2.15 says. 
For God loves to demonstrate the power of the gospel through weakness. Quote, I'll rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And when we sacrifice for one another within the covenant community, we grow in our unity, and it is a real witness to the world. Let's pray. Lord, give us grace to be faithful priests and sacrificing ourselves for you, following you, Lord Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen. Sorry about that. Thank you again, Dr. Beal. At this time, you are dismissed. Reminder, we are on convocation schedule, so students' class will start at 1120. Uh, Please enjoy the coffee and donuts outside. Convocation is now concluded. Thank you so much for joining us.